Thank you. So intuitively, we think about word learning as mapping a word form to a referent. And this can be quite challenging uh, in the complex scenes of the world. So this itself turns out to be a sophisticated phenomenon. And a large amount of literature is concerned with how we're able to learn that this is a cap and how we rule out every other incorrect item in the rest of the theme. But this is not the reality of most words. Um, so most words in most languages have multiple meanings. Um, an adult speaker of English would probably know about baseball caps and bottle caps. And if you believe me that that's a pen cap in the back, <laughs> an adult uh, speaker of English would uh, probably be able to tell you that as well. Um, if we try to understand the meanings of a word like cap as a definition over all these exemplars, we actually end up with something that underspecifies and overpredicts. So I'm going to tell you exactly what I mean by that um, right now. So if we say that the definition is a round thing that covers, that fits tightly, and that's only as big as your head, that seems like a nice definition. I think so. I came up with it myself. <laughs> um, and that would predict that all of these things should be fine examples of caps. right? They're round. They cover. They fit tightly. They're no bigger than your head. And at the same time, we would lose giant mushroom caps. They're too big. They're not tightly covering anything. And we would lose cap and trade programs, because they're not covering any physical thing and don't really have a literal size. So a definition tells you that these are caps and these aren't, when in reality it's the exact opposite, right? So the definition overpredicted and um, missed things. So you probably don't want to just abstract over these exemplars to understand this word, right? We probably want to store these experiences with these particular meanings and we're trying to learn them. And that's especially true because uh, many polysemous words like these extend on multiple dimensions that aren't a priori predictable and don't follow a single pattern or rule or extension. So for example, I can talk about a pit in someone's backyard, and it seems like a straightforward shape type of extension to also label an orchestra pit and an armpit. And the shape still seems to hold in the case of a fire pit and maybe a trading pit, although the trading pit is already starting to get away from our rule here, um, our shape rule, because it's really just a room with a lot of stuff on the ceiling. Um, and it doesn't just mean it's shape, right? Because we don't just call any hole in the ground a pit. We don't call ditches or pools pits. And critically, um, we can actually learn entirely different extensions that don't rely on that rule I just talked about. Um, so both of these are called fire pits. And it's not because they're like impressions in the ground in any way. Um, they're closer to like bowls or torches. Um, it's because of their function rather than their shape. Um, and I don't know if you can see the photo at the very top, uh, but that's a pit in a car racing track. That's what they call it. There's no impression in anything going on. It's literally just another lane in the, in the race track. Um, it's for pit stops, right? Um, and this is a different extension of pit. Um, yeah, and it doesn't seem to be a, this particular function or that particular shape anymore. But there's something about it that we could just similar. Um, so this word seems to simultaneously have both shape, shape and function extensions, and in fact, multiple conflicting uh, possibly function extensions. And we can't possibly know this unless we re represent our experiences with these exemplars. Um, so in fact, actually anywhere between 40 to 80 percent of words in English have multiple meanings that are related to one another. Um, I used this word before, but it's called polysemy. I'm going to keep using that word. Sorry, it's Greek. <laughs> uh, and you might think that the ways that labels are reused for multiple meanings is obvious, right? All of these are caps. And all of these seem to cover kind of like our definition approach before. Maybe you think learners of a language could sort of make these uh, guesses based off of very obvious features. But critically, the particular ways that different languages extend these words differs a ton. So English calls these caps, and we would call these other things lids. But Spanish would disagree. So in Mexico, we would probably call these items tapa, which is the word for cap. And that would sound weird to English speakers, right? So you might be surprised if I asked you to pass the cap to the pan. That would be surprising. Um, and there's lots of cross-linguistic variation like this that has been documented for a long time in semantics. Um, and what I think this tells us is that the ways that words extend are not obvious a priori until we learn the relationships that are relevant in our language. So at some point in learning, we need to be tracking that a cap can be this, and a cap can be this, and a cap can be this. Um, and critically, many word learning theories predict that this process should be actually competitive. Um, so evidence for any one of these meanings in particular is actually evidence against these other meanings, even if they're similar. 
And because of that, um, people haven't really looked a ton uh, to find out when kids start tracking multiple meanings. Um, there is evidence that older children can apply a rule that they've already learned from their language. Like in English, we know shape is a good cue to extending meaning. Um, so if uh, we're given novel items, we might extend their, uh, their labels to other meanings based off of shape. And um, we've actually looked at multidimensional extensions, more like these, but with novel words, in older kids and found that they can learn them better than um, these comparable, unrelated sets of meanings that are closer to homonyms, right? They don't have overlap or similarity. Um, but nobody really knows whether this is fundamental in word learning, um, or maybe it's something that happens later, right? So once children have established one clear meaning, um, then they can start extending it. We really don't know what this process looks like. Uh, so that's the question that we first set out to answer by using eye tracking with two-year-olds. Um, so we took polysemous pairs of meanings from English. Both of these are glasses. Both of these are caps. These are sheets. These are balloons. And these are collars. And we put kids in front of the eye tracker and asked whether they would be able to perform above chance on recognizing words like this. So if they're prompted, prompted to look at the cap, are they able to do that? And we did this for both sets of meanings that each word had. I can show you a trial. It will not have IO in it, unfortunately. So I will live narrate it. <laughs> look at the cat. Oh, sorry. Look at the collar. <laughs> um, make sure you have audio in your presentation. <laughs> OK, um, so what I'm going to show you here is the proportion of looks to target that our participants made. Um, the window of interest uh, is the well-known word recognition window from past literature, especially from Anne Fernald's lab. And it's outlined here in gray. Um, what we can see is that kids are above chance and that this is reliable. Um, and as a side note, you might wonder whether they're able to do both of these meanings. You might infer that maybe one of these meanings per word is much more frequent. Um, than the other, and we actually found no significant difference. So no significant difference between the higher and lower frequency meanings within each pair for each kid. So we actually got ratings from parents about the relative frequency of these two senses or meanings. Um, so great, they look like they know both of these meanings. And what we'd like to say this means is that when they encountered both of these meanings in the world, they learned each meaning from experience. They stored both of them. There are distinct representations, and they can draw on both of them. Um, but it's also possible to learn something vague or underspecified or even just one of these meanings and use it effectively to guess in a given trial, right? Maybe these trials are under constrained, um, or sorry, over constrained. There's only two options, right? Maybe they can figure it out because they have some vague, fuzzy representation of a cap like feature. So in this account, children would not have Are these examples, the picture, examples of the pictures that they saw? These two? Yeah. Yes. So they have no way of knowing how large that red thing is. Uh, it may be a bit larger Maybe than it's a flash. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I'll interview them about that the next time I see them. <laughs> so maybe they're just using uh, some type of inference here, right, based off that vague representation. Um, this would also be impressive, I think, right? So if they can use them under specification to get these things right, reliably above chance. Um, but we'd like to know one way or the other how they're doing this. So if this vagueness account is the case, we would actually predict that performance on a new target that also shares abstract properties of caps should also be successful and should be equally successful, right? Um, as you guys now know well, um, Tapa also labels uh, lib in other languages. So other languages validate that there's other ways to extend cap that are also reasonable. Um, but what I actually predict happening is different. So I hypothesize that toddlers have a mechanism to track multiple meanings from their language. Um, and that would predict that they should be more accurate on the English meanings because they've been tracking their exposure to them. Whereas these new meanings rely on recruiting a generalization and then inferring. So they should be slower to figure out. Um, they haven't experienced these, and therefore that experience, I think, wouldn't be stored. Um, so we took these same words in another language, in these cases, all the examples are in Spanish. Um, and we found a way that these words extend differently than English. So in several dialects of Spanish, you can also use gafas to refer to goggles, tapa to refer to lids, oja to refer to leaf, lobo refers to both globe and balloon, and collar also means necklace. After finding these, I was kind of like, why doesn't English do this? It makes so much sense. You just cut out all these words and use these. Um, so I'll show you a trial again. 
So this would be, look at the color. This is a two-year-old. Okay. Um, and what we saw in proportion to looking to target is that they're figuring these meanings out. So that's the gray line. Um, the reliably above chance. Uh, this is weird because these two-year-olds don't hear any Spanish. Um, we did not recruit toddlers who were Spanish speakers in their past lives <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> um, and critically, uh, though, I think we were surprised by that result. Um, but we also wanted to compare the conditions, right? So there is a significant difference between these two conditions. So while toddlers eventually figure out these novel polysemous extensions um, taken from another language that they've never seen, they're also showing us that they've been tracking the English meanings in their input. Otherwise, they wouldn't do better in that condition. Um, so to conclude, I think not all of toddlers' polysemous word knowledge can be explained by abstraction and inference, um, which I think is what drives that condition difference. I think there's simultaneously uh, or children are able to sim simultaneously track multiple candidate meanings for a given word as well. Um, and it also suggests that it's possible for them to learn other language extensions as well. Um, but we wanted to know sort of how much of children's like world actually looks like this. So we picked these polysemous words to test kids on. Um, we have no idea whether this is actually something that's prevalent in their lives, right? Maybe their parents are busy constraining their experience to one meaning for like years and years until they can finally, um, you know, be let loose on the polysemous world. Uh, so maybe this is just a cool trick they can do in the lab, but it's not something that they contend with, um, or maybe not until they're older. So we took child-directed speech corpora that were transcribed um, from the childless database. Um, and we looked at utterances containing the 200 most highly frequent nouns, verbs, and adjectives during the first three uh, years of life. And instead of hand coding these senses, which would take years, literally, um, we used a topic modeling technique. Um, so what a topic model does is find various consistent contexts in which our target words appear. Um, and these contexts or topics have been interpreted in past literature uh, to sort of evoke the various senses that we might uh, associate with a given word. So um, these are example topics coming out of past work from uh, Tom Griffiths. And um, each list or column that you see is a topic. Each one of these words has a probability associated with it. Um, and so it's order of descending probability. Um, and you can see here that the word bank shows up in money contexts, but also in contexts involving water and rivers, and also oil banks. I don't really know anything about that, but I gather it's a sense and reserves of reserves or something. Oil reserves, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and critically not confused with the other type of reserve, <laughs> uh, the bank reserve. Um, and so the other words contained in those topics tell you something about the meaning uh, or the context in which the word can appear. Um, and here are some topics uh, that we got from childless. Um, so these are topics for the word water, or topics in which the word water appears. Um, we didn't look for bank because we did not expect one-year-olds to hear that. <laughs> um, and uh, at first they look kind of messy. I think they seem really hard to summarize. We have to sort of read through them and make sense of them. And I think some of them are a little bit like splitting things in a too fine-grained way or else generalizing across contexts that we may not think uh, genuinely uh, should be uh, put together. Um, but we can look at them, and maybe if we look at the first one, the topic outlined in green, that might be associated with drinking water, right? Um, so the blue one might be associated with water you swim in, um, which can look totally different than drinking water, right? It might be brown water in a pond, um, right? So it would definitely appear in different contexts and might actually, at the start of learning, seem really different to children. Um, the orange one with the water that falls from the sky, which we call rain, um, that often ends up, uh, I think this is different because it's a little bit about rain and it's also a little bit about water sort of being on your, or like on your objects, right? And um, that also looks different, I think, to a child because water that falls from the sky, you really, the way you see it is kind of like a darkening of the objects around you, which is also perceptually a different experience, and I think that you have to integrate that to learn it's the same thing, um, that you swim in the same thing that you drink. Um, and what we just did was sort of very supervised, right? We looked at each one of these and we said, oh, I know what this one 
this is this meaning of the word. Um, and that would also take forever to do. Um, so what we can do is actually um, find attested meanings from the WordNet database and do this automatically. So WordNet has enumerated senses for most words. We can calculate the overlap between those senses and our topics. And from that, we can produce a count of how many senses there are per word that we modeled. So what I'll show you here is the average number of senses that a child hears at each age um, for the words we modeled. And uh, critically, this collapses over various types of ambiguity. So both polysemy and homonymy would be counted here. Um, so yeah, we don't at present have a way to distinguish between the two. Um, so starting with the first year of life, kids are hearing close to two meanings per word. Um, and it increases from there. Uh, so by two years, they're hearing about three senses per word. And maybe you're worried that this modeling technique is detecting these two senses, but it's really only one dominant sense that's accounting for most of the uses that a child hears, in which case they may not need to track multiple senses or they may not get the opportunity to. So we also calculated how dominant the highest frequency sense was at each age. So starting with the first year of life, the most highly frequent sense is only about 50% of the input of that word, right? So they're already hearing other senses up to 50% of the time. Um, and it only goes down from there uh, as you age because more senses are introduced, right? Um, and uh, so what we think this means is that the input is varied across multiple meanings rather than being highly skewed towards one dominant sense. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, questions we'd like to ask here, um, questions like how are these multiple meanings structured? Um, and also, how does polysemy affect the rest of your learning environment? Um, so I'm going to do a, I have time, so I'm going to do an audience participation. You guys are going to do an experiment. Uh, OK, so <laughs> I'm going to teach you that this is a kaisi. And then I will ask you to point to the kaisi. Actually, my point reading is really bad. <laughs> I'll just believe you got it right. OK. Um, and then I, if I ask you to find another Kaisi, which one are you guys going to point to? Right over here, yeah. Then I can ask you to find the Bosa. Find what? The Bosa. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, good job. Uh, we did this with 10 two year olds. So, this is pilot data. And first, we looked at whether they could extend accurately. Um, or as accurately as we believe. Um, and critically, I think what's important here, once they're able to do this, is that we never give them feedback on this. So they're never told, like, yep, you got Pisces right. They just proceed right onto the next trial. Um, so here they're, they're using their expectations about how plus me might work. Um, and they can also use these guesses, which they've not had confirmed, to disambiguate new meanings. Right. Oh, there should only be one square in this case. They select this one, right? So they're how, able to. How old are these kids? They're two. Two what? I mean, 24 months? Oh, they're an average of 30 months right now. But we're actually going to go younger. Let me see if we can go younger. Yeah. Um, so what, what we think this might mean is that not only um, are you able to make guesses about additional meanings a word might have in a totally novel environment, but that you can use those guesses to narrow down how complex, uh, how much input you're getting uh, for other candidate meanings for other words, possibly. Um, I don't have a conclusion slide, but I do have a bunch of people that helped me a lot with this, so thank you. Polysemy or just extension? It seems like it could be another reference for a kaipi as anything of, of that shape, and, and I'm not sure how you could test for polysemy versus just uh, you know another reference that falls within the, the category. But. Well, so I think, it, I think that's sort of a problem with our, our general approach to how we think about words. Right. I, I think like probably a lot of mm. things that fall within a category are in a gradient yeah. of how much of that same kind you really think it is. But uh, we, we did experimentally try to control for this because we were also worried. Mm. So we have shape extensions, but we also have texture extensions, material extensions. Mm. Um, so we're hoping uh, that by giving them a variety um, that it will tap into some more general idea about word extensions and not just, oh, you can use shape and then, right. you know, then you get sure. it right. Mm -hmm. um, so we have ones where, like, they actually look like natural language extensions. So, for example, the animal for fur pattern that exists in a lot of languages. Mm -hmm. So we literally have, like, Where novel objects yeah. that we remove the outer part of. <laughs> uh, I swear it's not that violent. <laughs> it looks <laughs> fine for children. Uh, but, yeah, we, we use other types that, that don't share that shape because shape is such a Kids yeah. are so tuned to shape.